There we go. Thank you very much for reminding me of that. And uh, our panel is here to talk about, uh, the, the, the panelists are here to talk about their views and perspectives on barriers and challenges to recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce, including strategies and best practices to overcome these challenges. So I'm gonna introduce each of my panelists, um, and once I'm done the introduction, I'm gonna to turn to them and ask them to give about three minutes introductory remarks to frame the issues before we move on to our discussion questions. So I'm very pleased to announce we have with us, um, starting at the end, Amri Johnson, Global Head, Diversity and Inclusion at Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. Welcome, Amri. We have David Wilson, President of Morgan State University. We have Cecilia Rouse, Dean, and the Lawrence and Shirley Katzman and Lewis and Ernst, Lewis and Anna Ernst, Professor in the Economics of Education and Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University. <laughs> okay, I've just taken time away from your minutes of introduction <laughs> and remarks. Okay, and, um, and uh, Lisa Cariagalo, who is Vice President for Academic Development and Diversity and Inclusion here at Brown. So let me turn to Lisa first and see if you'd like to have a few opening remarks. Thank you, Celeste. Good afternoon, everybody. So I want to focus um, my brief remarks uh, really to take us back to the real work of this alliance. And that work, I believe, is about um, rethinking and redesigning our institutions so that they can have the capacity to more fully collaborate and support the work that we need to do to diversify the 21st century workforce. And by redesigning the, our institutions, I mean the idea that we need to reimagine the work that we must do with respect to policy and practices in order to fully embrace the meaning and prospects of diversity. How do we define diversity? How do we do the work of diversity? Who does that work? How do we map out that work in meaningful ways so that we can fully understand where the gaps are as well as where the opportunities are? We continue to be befuddled by uh, the lack of underrepresentation of historically underrepresented groups in academia. I believe that fundamentally that is a problem that we need to address as much as we have in fact diversified our undergraduate populations and even to some extent our graduate student and postdoc populations, we have not done the kind of intentional focus work to diversify the professoriate in order to fully support an institution that in, in fact embodies inclusive excellence. And so that is the work that we must do. And in doing that work, we need to recognize and understand how we think about merit. What does merit look like in the academic pipelines that we develop as institutions? How do we form community? Who belongs? Who has a voice in those, in those communities, in our communities? And finally, how do we think about an ecological view of development that in fact embraces the kinds of things the Leadership Alliance has done in order to provide support and scaffold the, the work that our students need to do in order to thrive and survive through the academic pipeline? So I will end there. And, and Thank David you very much. David? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just one. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me uh, start out by acknowledging the great and terrific work of uh, President Paxton and Brown University uh, for the leadership uh, provided uh, to the Alliance over the years. And all of us, have, as you have seen through the reports that we already heard, uh, have seen the tremendous progress that has been made. And so we all committed to continuing down that path. Um, I thought I would take my opening comments and root them, if you will, uh, in the great history of Morgan State University, uh, and in doing so, acknowledge once again um, the president of Morehouse College, who is also in this space, uh, Xavier University in this space, uh, and Spelman College uh, in this space, and Claflin as well, because they could also be making similar comments. Um, let me just say a word or two about Morgan um, to place it in the context of this topic, how important it is um, to not just sustain a diverse work 
force, but to grow one. Uh, because as you heard from Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, we're nowhere close to where we need to be in terms of a diversified workforce that is going to reflect the browning of America in the next few decades. Uh, Morgan State University uh, is an institution uh, rooted in the HBCU tradition. Uh, we were established in 1867, and we, like Morehouse, will be opening our curtain January 1, 2017, on our sesquicentennial year. And over the last 149 years, uh, I can say that that institution has done a remarkable job in churning out graduates to do exactly what we are talking about here today, to be the innovators in America, the leaders in America, and to lead to a more inclusive and diverse America. Morgan State University today is number one uh, in the United States in producing African-American electrical engineers. Uh, we are number one in producing African-American civil engineers, and we're number one in producing African-American industrial engineers. Uh, we're number three in producing African-American engineers in all fields. Um, by the way, North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro is number one, uh, Georgia Tech is number two, and Morgan is number three. Um, we also rank 15th nationally uh, in the number of baccalaureate degrees in all fields awarded to African Americans. Uh, indeed, as I was showing these data to my colleague, Dr. Wilson from Morehouse before this session, the National Science Foundation conducted a study, uh, released it about two years ago, and they looked at um, individuals in the United States, African Americans, who have uh, the PhDs in science and engineering disciplines, uh, and they wanted to know where they received their undergraduate degrees. Every single black person in the United States between 2008 and 2012. Uh, and it revealed that the top 10 institutions are all HBCUs. When they broke it down by gender and looked at all black males in the US during that time period who had a PhD and they wanted to know where they got their undergraduate degree, uh, Morgan State was number two in the nation. When they broke it down by females, uh, Morgan State was number one in the nation. And so, the takeaway here uh, is that uh, as we get serious about this topic, um, we can't get to that level of seriousness without having institutions like the ones that I'm talking about driving that conversation. You know, when uh, we are only 3% of all of higher ed institutions but are outproducing these graduates who are going on uh, and getting their PhDs in the research arena and in other arenas uh, at uh, other institutions that are represented here today and uh, not represented here today. Uh, and so uh, I uh, have been quite vocal in this space, <laughs> for those of you who have followed a little bit of my commentary, uh, because this is the first time that I have been in an administrative position uh, at this level at an HBCU. Um, I started my career uh, at Rutgers. I was an associate provost at Rutgers. Uh, and then I went to Auburn as a vice president at Auburn. And then I went from there to Wisconsin where I was a chancellor within the University of Wisconsin system. Uh, and then I came to Morgan. And I have seen the ecosystems uh, on those campuses that I named. And I have seen some successes, but I have seen some great failures. And what I've seen at Morgan <laughs> has absolutely turned on its head all of the things that I thought uh, I had seen in other places that were successful. Um, it's an incredible uh, culture and an environment uh, for producing the kind of talent that we are talking about the likes of which I had not seen as a senior administrator in the other places, 
And I will talk more about that as we get into the next part of the program. Uh, hello. Um, so uh, behind the long title, which is really ridiculous, but OK. Um, uh, I'm, I'm an economist. I'm a labor economist. And uh, I think a lot about issues in the labor market. I think a lot about issues in the economics of education. and. As, I, as you reflect and as we're talking about the importance of diversity in the academic and research workforce, I want to make one pitch for us going beyond just thinking about it's important to have a research workforce that reflects America, it's important to have schools that reflect America. I think that's all, I think that's important, but I want to make a plug for another reason. There's a lot of growing evidence that suggests that uh, diverse groups just make better decisions. So if we're, as a country, if we're going to remain competitive in terms of innovation, in terms of research, in terms of where we're headed, it's really important that we have all hands on deck and that we have many different viewpoints trying to tackle many different problems. Arguably, my profession, economics, uh, due to the profound lack of diversity, which I will talk about in a minute, I think we may take the cake, actually, if you look at the numbers. Um, arguably, it was that homogeneity, not just on racial and gender lines, but of thought, which led to the severe consequences of the Great Recession, that there was just a groupthink that was going on. Because part of what happens when diverse people are thinking about problems in their, from their own perspective, seeing different parts of the elephant, as I like to remind everybody, is that they challenge one another, they don't, take, they don't take assumptions for granted, and they see different parts of the elephant. And they understand that, yes, that looks like that might be a good idea over here, but if you really understand this part of our country, um, let me tell you what's happening over there. Uh, so I would just make a plug for that's another reason why the work that you're doing is so very important and the work that we all do in the academy. Um, I also wanted to say that as dean of a public policy school, and uh, okay, I shouldn't say this here, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, we care a lot about racial and ethnic diversity, but the dimension on which our school has the biggest challenges is on diversity of political thought. And we work very hard. There's not a box that people check that says, I voted for, um, we don't know who that, we don't really know people's political views, but as a school of public policy, if I don't have all political viewpoints represented in the classroom, our students aren't getting the best education that they could be getting, and we're not helping to produce the best leaders in all, in all spaces. So while race and ethnicity is critically important, and I'm going to tell you how I spend the rest of my time, which is focusing on race and ethnicity and economics, I, I do want to put it out there that I think diversity of all kinds is really critical in the academy. And I would arguably say that uh, it is some of the successes in generating diversity that has led us to this latest wave of thought on campuses because people who think differently, it's hard, it's messy. And when you're sitting across the dining room table with someone who just doesn't think like you do, that's uncomfortable. Um, but it's important work to be done, and I think we can get there, and I think we can get there respectfully, uh, but, it's, but it's not easy. Um, but I do work on, um, so I, one of the other things I do is I chair the American Economic Associations let me take a deep breath. Committee on the Status of Minority Groups in the <coughs> Economics Profession. Uh, we go by SEMGEP for short, but we're missing a few vowels, truly. Um, and which is a committee that the AEA put in place in the early 70s because it recognized it had a problem back then on racial diversity, uh, mostly racial at that point, but we've brought it to ethnic diversity as well. Um, they created a committee that looks at women as well called CSWEP uh, around the same time. Uh, what SEMGEP was initially created to do was to oversee a summer pipeline program, and I can talk more about that, but the whole purpose of that pipeline program was to help get more minority students interested in economics and to have the background they need to apply to and be successful in graduate programs. Um, I've done a kind of, um, I don't want to call it, it's not an experimental, so it's not, not the most rigorous evaluation, but it was pretty good um, evaluation of the summer program, and it actually looks like it's been very important in diversifying economics. Now, that's a low bar, 
And I don't want to say we're certainly far from mission accomplished because while there were gains in the 90s in economics for both minorities and uh, you know blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, and for women, there's been a lot of plateauing um, over the 2000s. And so it's been a stubborn, there's almost like a ceiling effect. There's been better success for women than for um, the ethnic and racial minorities, and we can talk more about that. Um, but I'm just going to briefly say that my remarks over the course of our conversation will, I kind of divide them into two ways. We need to attack the supply which is getting students interested in economics. So I'm going to use economics, but I'm thinking about research more generally, which I understand what the Leadership Alliance does. Uh, we need to, under, as, as you guys do, recognize, get the students to understand this is an important and viable and exciting career path. Um, and in economics, I think that's doubly, that's doubly challenged. Um, we need to make sure that they're prepared for the programs that they may be applying to. We need to get them through the programs. Um, and so that's the supply side. But on economics in particular, we recognize there's a demand side. It's, our, it's on us to make the programs interesting, to make sure the curriculum is relevant um, and exciting. Um, we have a lot to do in terms of how we select students for graduate school. We have a lot to do in terms of our hiring practices. And if you want to talk about a field where we think there's a lot of implicit bias, I would say it's economics. Uh, so that's the demand side as well. I would also put out there that employers need to be more flexible. Uh, when you have, you know, a lot of our educational institutions and employment um, workplaces organized around, and I'm just going to go there, the white guy with a wife who stays at home and takes care of the kids. So it's this nine to, you know, nine to five, you don't have any other distractions. You went to school between the ages of 18 and 22. You had no other responsibilities. Your parents paid for you. Um, and it's organized around some notional person, maybe from the 1950s, although I don't even know if that was true then, but that's how we think about it. Um, and that if we're going to really embrace diversity um, on college campuses, we have to recognize that our students are coming with very different backgrounds, and in our workplaces that people are, are human beings, and that they have lives outside of their work, and that we have to be flexible on that front too. And I'll leave it at that. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a Morehouse man, and I wrote something out, and it was so long that I decided that I would do something a little bit shorter for my opening remarks. Uh, so, but thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be in front of such a distinguished crowd, and it's good to see so many friends. We've been at this for a minute. Um, actually, years ago, we wrote an article called Where Are the Black Scientists? And I could probably keep asking that question, particularly in the, in, in the in, in industry, because the numbers just aren't there, and they're probably not going to get there in our lifetime if we keep kind of perpetuating the same practices that we've done uh, for the past 25 years. It's not a bad thing or a, a criticism of those practices, because I think we've done everything that we could. At the same time, I think there's a new paradigm that has to begin, and uh, for us at, at the institutes, uh, it's, it's, it's vital, not just because we want the numbers, but because we know <clears throat> if we're not doing this well, we simply aren't going to be able to reimagine medicine like Novartis is trying to do if we only are focused on or have a representation for a small part of the uh, people on the planet. So um, to keep my opening remarks as short as possible, uh, give a quick overview of Novartis Institutes. We're the research division of the Novartis Pharmaceutical Company. We're kind of like the engine of, of this massive 125,000 person global um, organization based in Switzerland. So the research institution is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We also, of course, are strong in partnership with our development institution or organization. Um, both of us are global. Uh, so my perspective on this is global, even though a lot of the programs that we've done with my colleague Anastasia and Anda here are here today have been uh, very much focused on the U.S., we also have programs and develop uh, talent from around the planet. So we have a program that develops students and, and, uh, and faculty from, from the continent of Africa. We have students coming and, and faculty and, and uh, scholars from South America, et cetera, to bring that diversity to our campus and expose our scientists to somebody that they probably wouldn't be exposed to if we didn't bring them on the campus. So this isn't just about a kind of a paternal way of doing things like oftentimes we see around corporate responsibility in corporations. We know that this is something that's really about our bottom line, and we are building these relationships because they know we know they're vital to us building a long-term capacity in those particular areas so that we can do great science for the long haul. So I'm thinking about the entire innovation chain when it comes to drug discovery. Uh, even though I work for the research division, we're feeding pretty much everything, and there's people that are coming out of research and going into commercial 
and coming out of development and going into uh, various parts of, of sales and operations. So this is a pretty broad opportunity and it's uh, inclusive of people that are getting PhDs and MDs, but it's also inclusive of people that decide that they want to get a, a undergrad in engineering and then go on and get an MBA and want to come in and work in some other part of our organization. So three things that we've done philosophically um, at the institutes uh, is that we've been focused on this night notion of exposure versus aptitude. And we know that we have a lot of really, really, really bright students, and they have a lot less exposure than someone who has been sitting around the dinner table with Nobel laureates since they were six years old. And some of us that know people whose children sit around the table with Nobel laureates, we know the difference between what they do when they get to uh, graduate school and when they get out of graduate school and the network that they have versus somebody who didn't really get turned on by science until they were 15. It's a very different trajectory. If we talk about the 10,000 hour rule, we know that we've lost some hours between the ages of six and 15. So that's one. So we've, we've been looking at this whole idea of diversity really as intersectional. I know all the scholars in here know about intersectionality, but what does that actually mean? For us, it's, it's the fact that all of us are not a monolithic notion of anything. We're not a monolithic notion of our gender, of our race, of our ethnicity, whatever it might be. We're myriad possibilities for innovation, myriad possibilities for contribution, and you have to be able to insert that mindset into an organization to mitigate the resistance that often comes. And it used to be that it was actually loud, and kind of loud right now, but it used to be where it was very loud across the board. Now it's really silent, the resistance, and we want to be able to mitigate that by framing it. Secondly, um, for us, it's creating these bridging ties. Those of us that have been looking at uh, kind of social capital know that we have a tendency to bond with people like ourselves. We've been very intentional in our mentoring, in our programs to bring people that normally would not connect intentionally together. Uh, lastly, these, uh, these bridges from, to one another also create uh, what I would say is, is, is inclusive networks, or I, you could even call them innovative networks of difference. So people that are exposed to people different than them also begin the process of getting access to the networks of those people different than them. As a result, they begin to share ideas a lot more rapidly and uh, with a, a lot more context than you get if you're just generally in, uh, in interacting with people like yourselves or people in this circle. I can say the people in this room, I know a lot of you. And that's good and that's maybe not so good. <laughs> It's good because you're fantastic. <laughs> it's not so good because there's a lot of people that could be in this room, overflowing this room so that we can build the kind of networks that we need for people to have that instrumental support and ability to consistently contribute and build through their careers throughout uh, their time in academia or industry or wherever they might be. So um, I'll stop there and go back to our... <laughs> the next thank, thank you, Amri. Okay, um, let me start with the first question, and I think I'm going to ask uh, Cecilia to start with the answer to this one, and we'll see where we go. Uh, what is the current climate in various employment sectors, and what barriers exist that prohibit the recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce? <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, so, I, you know, I, so various sectors, I'm really not sure how to think about that. So uh, we're, I think we're really thinking about the academy here. Um, and I have to say I know much more about um, economics than I do about a lot of other uh, fields in, um, in, at, in the academy, in the post-secondary level. Uh, so I'm going to speak from economics, although really I think that these apply. So um, I think one is, uh, you know, Okay, so I work on the economics of education, and I sometimes quip, we're always pushing the problem down. So yes, we have a problem at the post-secondary level. It's the fault of K through 12, yes. I mean, of you know, high schools, yes. We have a problem in high school. It's middle school, yes, middle school. But I assume it's the prenatal environment that really matters. <laughs> um, and, you know, so it really does matter. I mean, I don't want to be too light on this because we do know that those early experiences matter a lot. But at some point, you have to just, you have what you have. But I do think that 
um, part of the barriers that we struggle with goes back to our K through 12 system and the fact that there's a lot of inequality there. There's a lot of cu cu there's a lot of inequality in pre-K and probably prenatally. But so that kids, when they come to college or have have had very different experiences, are very come uh, very differently uh, prepared. And so when they get to college, the question is, how do you handle that? Now I know, for example, when it comes to some of the the STEM fields. Um, so like medicine, for example, at Princeton, as an example, one of the th barriers that we've noticed is that if you've been to a prep school, the math you've had, the preparation you've had, you're ready to hit the ground running on the pre-med requirements that you need in order to, to set on that track. Um, if you didn't come prepared by the time, you know, if you then try to jump into the typical pre-med track, you're just not ready. And so a lot of those students end up getting discouraged. They don't get the grades that they would like. They get discouraged. They end up in a, in a different field. So they're very bright students in the we're liberal arts, so we think all fields are wonderful. Uh, but they were discouraged out of STEM. And so I know that, for example, our engineering department, our math department are trying to rethink how they do some of those first year classes, even some of the advising. How is it that you can rethink some of the advising of students? So they take the courses. Some of this involves the, uh, what they do in the summer, maybe before they come. And what else do you have over the summer? But to recognize that students are not all coming equally prepared to jump into these pre-med courses and that some of, the, some of that discouragement is happening there. Um, so I think some of it is just, let's face it, is in the preparation that the students have and, we, uh, and they need additional help. Um, and we also need to be revising our curricula. Um, at not at the, so much the level of the, of the institutions I think are represented here. I do a lot of work in community colleges, but I think it's relevant. Um, is also just rethinking what math and what gateway math is really important for some of the courses and some futures that we need. We know statistics is vitally important for many, many fields in our everyday lives. Um, not as many fields use calculus, not as many fields geometry. I mean, my kids are in high school, so I can see the math teachers like geometry sort of sticks out like this. Um, you know, not so important. Uh, but we still force our students to go through these, these sequences. A lot of students get stuck at the math, you know, th those math gateways, and it's not, they're not necessarily being tested on the math that they're actually going to need. So I think there involves some revamping of our curricula so that it's distilled down to what are the what is the preparation students actually need to be successful and to focus on that. Um, in terms of the workforce, I, I guess what I would go to is um, you know I think in in economics and I think I imagine a lot of other fields the way we hire the way we do graduate you know admissions is uh, you know it matters a lot whether I recognize the name of the person who wrote you the letter of recommendation. And if I don't recognize the name, I don't know how to evaluate the letter of recommendation. Or if you come from an institution not from which I'm not familiar, of which I'm not familiar, I don't know how to interpret your, your algebra two class or your linear algebra class. What level was it really? And so we have a tendency to replicate ourselves and not take the risk on the institutions about which we know less. So I think there's, there's I, I know many institutions, you know, so my world is, you know, Harvard, MIT, Princeton. I know they're trying to do a better job of reading those applications more thoroughly and more creatively, but I think that's a tough one. And it hap goes, flows through to hiring. We're now doing in hiring season in economics. You know, who do you call? You call your buddies at the other institutions that you know. Um, economists are trying to get more creative in how they identify really talented minority and female candidates. Uh, I think the women are easier on this front than the minority candidates. Uh, but I think it's incumbent to get even more creative so that they can really uncover the students who may not be part of the typical slipstream, uh, but nonetheless are, are very qualified for the department. Um, Lisa, would you sure. like to add? I guess to that point, I would say that Part of the work that we need to do in terms of redesigning and reimagining our institutions have to be centered uh, in many ways on the lived experiences of the diverse students that we have brought to our institutions. If we have now ma you know, majority minority learners at our institutions, what are our obligations as institutions to be, in fact, ready for those students? What are the infrastructures that we are creating? What are the programs? Um, Cecilia mentioned, for instance, pre-orientation programs, new ways of reimagining introductory courses, but what other types of programs, and indeed, what other ways of, of um, approaches and, and innovations can we develop to rethink 
not just uh, courses, but entire curricula, to rethink the way in which content is developed, um, to rethink the way in which we provide more innovative and inclusive pedagogical approaches that invite students to broadly participate in the classroom and outside of the classroom. How should we think about the way in which we center our institutions around the life course of a student from a diverse background. We know, as uh, Anthony Carnevale often does say uh, in his work around education and the workforce, that merit and opportunity is often an accident in a circumstance of birth. And that in fact, how people have access to resources related to education and the ways in which they are prepared to take advantage of the education that we provide as institutions are often inequitable. And so what then do we do to level this playing field, to support the needs of our diverse learners? And I think what Le the Leadership Alliance has actually done in terms of providing resources early on, as they do with FIRE, for exposure, uh, but also providing the opportunity to develop skills to more fully navigate and negotiate uh, their education uh, is a really critical piece and one that we need to look at. And then I guess I would add to that the notion again of this life course trajectory. How do we, we have spent billions of dollars at NIH and NSF over the past 30 years on pipeline programs. And to some extent, we might say that those pipeline programs have in fact uh, succeeded because the students are now at our institutions. But what we have failed to do in those programs is really to make more accountable the institutions who have received those billions of dollars of funding in really um, addressing what progress are, we have made as institutions to ensure that those students do go on to purposeful work uh, in the areas that they wish to aspire to, whether that is in academia, so much of it in academia. I could tell you the, the number of um, trainees that I've seen go through the Leadership Alliance pipeline who started out excited and uh, who wanted to very much become part of the professoriate, and half of them have gone on through to very productive careers, but in government, in industry, and I don't know that they would necessarily have left their goals of academic work if they had not faced the barriers. So I, I do think institutions need to be accountable to, to understanding what are those barriers structurally that we have created that we have not yet uh, owned up to to ensure that we are in fact creating institutions that address the life course needs of diverse learners. Thank you. David, would you like to comment? I have uh, actually three reactions. Um, I, I would like to use a football analogy to try and knit together the comments from uh, both Cecilia and Lisa. Uh, imagine, if you will, that um, you had a quarterback and you put a blinder on over one of the eyes. And you said to the quarterback, now you got to play this game and you have to have a 95% completion rate but you can only look at one half to feel. Well, that's going to be very, very, very difficult. And so going back to the comment that Cecilia made, if indeed from the employment perspective, uh, um, we find a culture, and I think we do, where individuals are relying heavily on their contacts, uh, their school contacts, who is in this network, who is in that network. And you have some perceptions about entities that are not a part of that network, and you're not looking at the whole field, uh, then I think from an employment standpoint, you're going to have a real hard time um, diversifying your workforce because you're not considering the entire football field. And so um, uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second is that I have been struck um, the last three or four years in particular uh, with um, the experiences that I've had uh, with numerous corporations, and particularly uh, those that are in quote unquote the innovation space, in Silicon Valley and in other areas, uh, at the huge disconnect between the cultures uh, of those institutions uh, and perhaps the rigidity 
uh, of the cultures within many of our academic institutions. Uh, and from the standpoint of our HBCUs, I think it's even more severe. Uh, and so, therefore, you have a situation where you could have students uh, who are coming out of, out of our institutions with almost perfect 4.0 averages, and they are very, very competitive on any kind of cognitive or academic achievement measure. Uh, but when they get to some of the corporations and the environment there is just so different, it's just so informal, it's just so innovative. And if 35% of the way the corporations are selecting them is based on the fit piece, you know, are you the right fit for Google? Are you the right fit for Facebook? And they are determining that, you know, through these human pieces, and they're bringing to that, once again, their own set of experiences, right? That's a problem. And I tell you, uh, I had a conversation with one uh, entity about this just last week uh, and said, you know, <laughs> We need to talk about a different type of collaboration. We need to talk about a collaboration where when I start thinking about building an academic building at Morgan, I need to have you from the private sector there at least talking with us about how we should even think about the space in that building where we are not putting people in silos, you know, where we are creating a climate on our campuses that is in alignment with what some of these students will have to see when they leave us. Uh, and so uh, that's a way of thinking a little bit differently about curricular reform uh, because you have to, I, I, I've challenged them as well to make these opportunities available for our faculty you know, to come and spend some time in that space so they begin to understand um, what they need to do to uh, think, rethink curricular uh, in a way now that would be in greater alignment with uh, the innovation that has to take place in order for our country to remain competitive long term. Uh, the third point, uh, and this is uh, you know, going back to the Morgan versus non-Morgan. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and this has to do with um, what I see in higher education. So uh, the non-Morgan experience that I've had um, has led me to believe that in the case of uh, minority professors, uh, and I do, I believe very, very strongly in um, representational diversity. Um, I, believe, I believe strongly in diversity of thought. I believe very, very strongly in geographic diversity, but I also believe very, very strongly in representational diversity as well. Um, and, and, and what I saw there was that if you had very few African-American faculty members, um, and those faculty members were in that space, invariably, because there are so few, Almost all of your African-American students on campus are going to gravitate to that person. Every single committee that you establish on campus, that person is going to be on it. So you have overburdened these three African-American faculty members that you have on your campus with everything. And then five years later, where are the books and where are the 15 articles? And so you have given them all of this stuff and you are expecting them to be successful in the same way as those who are not burdened with those responsibilities. So that's what I saw non-Morgan. At Morgan, while that is not the case, the case is similar in a different way. Uh, we are a doctoral research university. There are 10 HBCUs that are doctoral research, and I would say that the other nine could, could perhaps be here making the same statement. The faculty there are teaching seven and a half courses per year, right? And I have to knock on wood, I couldn't believe it. They rarely complain. They have the mission of the university in their proverbial gut. They believe so strongly in what they do. They give their students their cell phone numbers. They still do the research. They still write the books. But they are overburdened in a different kind of way. And so if at the end of the day we truly are about creating now w within the university community um, climates that will lead to the retention 
of faculty of color and the retention of faculty members who are disproportionately churning out students of color in underrepresented areas, i.e. HBCUs, we're going to have to figure out a way in which we can reduce these burdens in both genres. And so that's the way I would respond. Thank you. OK, so um, it's Omri's turn, but I'm going to ask him to segue his answer into the another question so we could move along in the interest of time. And we're just going to go to, to our last question, which was what models of collaborations and partnerships among academia, employers in the public and private sectors, and policymakers will meet the nation's need for a skilled and diverse workforce. And again, the interest of time, I'd like you to just limit um, your example, just one collaboration or partnership. I mean. that, that was my favorite question. <laughs> you, then I'm, I'm glad I asked you to go well, I, I, About three, four years ago, we started a relationship with Claflin University. And what it did was open our eyes to what's possible when you have a dedicated faculty combining with industry to bring students through the pipeline in a way that exposes them to things that they just wouldn't likely be exposed to without that relationship. And what we found with all these amazing students, and tip my hat to, you, to the president, uh, is that they just needed a little bit of an opening to close the gap, and we didn't have to do a lot more than that. Now, of course we did. But if once they had that opening, it was possible. So I think fundamentally, there's not enough industry academic partnerships. And I don't know how open some of our institutions are to doing that in a way that actually is transformational to uh, what we're trying to do in, in, in the STEM disciplines. Because we're, the, the numbers aren't going to change unless industry starts taking a stance uh, to do this more. It's particularly in the, um, uh, the STEM workforce that we know that we, there's, there's the, that's where the jobs are. And if we start thinking about economic dynamics in this country, the gap's just going to get bigger if we don't do something about that. And it's not just about you know, people of color getting jobs. This is much bigger than that. And I think the conversation has been limited to this us-them dynamic around, you know, all oh, we need to get us in there. But them is not saying anything, but not letting anybody in. So it's like a cycle of reincarnation that's not actually happening, and we can't escape it. You know, so so um, I I think in terms of um, I think early exposure is huge. Blacksmiths, bakers, and candlestick makers. Their children become blacksmith bakers and candlestick makers. And I can say I was uh, at an event with my colleague Chad Womack a while back, and his daughter was like examining the pond of tadpoles at Emory University. Now, Chad's a scientist, and his daughter's inherently curious about science. There's something there. Not everybody's parents going to be a scientist, but everybody can begin that exposure early. And I think when we do, that, that the climate stuff actually becomes a little bit easier, because most of the climate dynamics aren't necessarily going away because there's like humans in corporations. <laughs> and they're going to be like human, you know? But can we do some things to get people ready to know how to deal with humans um, and have the confidence in their, in their scientific acumen to, to balance those two things out? So I'll stop there, because I can talk for a very, very long time. <laughs> Thank you, Amri. Um, Lisa, you want to answer this one? So uh, I, I think that, I, again, I want to go back to a more systemic view of this work. Um, I think that what we see around this room today is a remarkable uh, group of individuals from all sectors, industry, government, uh, public, private, universities and colleges, nonprofit institutions, corporations. And I think that we need to be able to think about systemically what are the mechanisms by which we can more fully intentionally come together. And I want to offer up a, an interesting example. So, and I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Valentine from NIH who will shortly be speaking with you, uh, with all of us. And I think that uh, there is a particular role for agencies to play. NSF and NIH and the DOE have a particular bully pulpit 
to compel all of us to come together to think about and develop new models of engagement uh, across all of our institutions. Yes, the Leadership Alliance has been able to do this work um, meaningfully over many years, but it has been because we have had the support, financially and otherwise, of, of institutions like NIH and NSF and the DOE and Mellon to be able to create these systems and infrastructures that allow us to exchange faculty, that allow us to exchange students, that allow us to develop new collaborations across institutions. So I would argue for programs like <coughs> IMSD that is funded by NIH, the Initiative for Maximizing Student Development, many PIs of IMSD are, are here today. Um, I would argue for programs like NSF's AGEP, the Alliance for Graduate Education and the Professoriate. I would argue for the UNCF Mellon and the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowships, because those are structures that cut across our institutions that allow us to identify and systematically track students from diverse backgrounds throughout the life course of their career trajectories. And if we can do that in a larger way, I believe that we can actually address uh, these larger issues of d diversifying the 21st century workforce. Thank you. Um, David, do you want to talk about one particular collaboration or partnership? Just one. <laughs> just, just one? I, I had about 15 here, right? Uh, and no, uh, actually, um, I would just like to pick up on the NIH uh, because uh, we were successful in getting a $23 million build grant from NIH. Um, and uh, we are in the uh, second year of that grant. Uh, and the purpose is to uh, really educate the next generation of minority bioscientists. Uh, and it's a wonderful, wonderful model uh, where we are collaborating with uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, University of Maryland Medical School, uh, and the dean of the graduate school at Brown University is a part of our uh, team uh, that is coming in and making sure uh, that our students who are rising sophomores when they enter this program uh, or um, going into a really competitive opportunity where they understand research in a different way. And so uh, just to briefly ex explain this model, because um, I really have to take my head off to the faculty at Morgan. They're always looking at ways to do things differently if indeed what they have been doing in the past has not worked. And so this particular $23 million grant is taking the whole research paradigm uh, and turning it around. Uh, and they are introducing a more entrepreneurial approach to undergraduate research as opposed to an apprenticeship model. And the apprenticeship model is one where a professor invites a student to work on a research project in his or her lab that is of interest to the professor. And they give the student a task, a very concrete task, and say, okay, you just go here and you just code this. And what our faculty realized there was that some of the students, and they did their research had become turned off by that because they could not see the connection between the sort of segmentation of these responsibilities and the excitement about research overall. And so this entrepreneurial model is one where uh, we are saying to students, you come up with your own research idea and you have to go through an eight week summer program to perfect that idea under the tutelage of professors you have to present your research proposal in a competitive environment. And we bring in the professors from Brown and Hopkins and Maryland. They sit as an NIH panel would. And the students have uh, 10 minutes to make that presentation. Uh, and then 20 students are selected to be funded. And they get a $20,000 grant to carry out that research, which is of interest to them. And the level of excitement, because I've sat through two of these now during the summer, it's just amazing to see these rising sophomores uh, in biology and chemistry and psychology. Uh, now, all of a sudden, they are extraordinarily excited about research. And they can't wait uh, now to get that PhD or to go to uh, medical school. Uh, and so uh, I really want to just express our appreciation to the BUILD program at NIH. I hope that. Um, we see that program around for a while, and we'll see results uh, in terms of students coming through it, uh, going on to graduate school, uh, medical school, getting those degrees, 
and we'll see even greater numbers when we have this forum again uh, in terms of the productivity. Thank you. Okay, Cecilia, you get the last word here. What's your favorite uh, collaboration or partnership model? Um, so first of all, I'm going to make a pitch for why it really does take a village. Many of the programs we're thinking about do not just benefit the individual students or benefit the institution that may be hosting or providing some of the funding for, but really benefits all of us. And many institutions can't support these programs because they can't justify, oh, you know, these students do the summer program and they're going to come back to our institution. So they can't fully justify it either if they're publicly funded or even many um, not-for-profit um, institutions as well because the trustees say, wait, how do we benefit? So it really does take a village. We have to recognize our social um, collaboration. So, you know, to collapse back to the economics, the summer program uh, is an example of such a, a public good uh, where it is, we've had the host institution is, has, is moved around. It's currently at um, Michigan State University. Uh, so Michigan State itself is putting in substantial resources. The American Economic Association is putting in substantial resources. And they get in resources where they can from, they're going to be applying for grants from um, private companies and for, um, you know, from philanthropy. In the past, it's been funded by the Mellon Foundation, by MacArthur, uh, by Sloan. Uh, they all get a little exhausted after a while, by NSF as well, get exhausted after a while, which I think is fair. But the point is, it really does take a village, and even just to support this very long-standing and arguably very effective um, pipeline program. 